acute care nurse practitioner. I am a critical care intensivist. That's been my specialty since uh, coming out of school uh, back in 2017. Uh, I'd really like to kind of understand the audience here. So if you could just raise your hands, if every, anybody that does primary care, okay. So that's most everybody. Uh, outpatient specialty, a combination of inpatient and outpatient specialty. Okay, good. Um, anybody exclusively inpatient like me? Okay, any intensivists in here? Just, okay, so you and I are gonna bond. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's see if we can get this all to work. We're having a little issue. And we'll do it from, no, that's not it. Okay, help. None of the buttons are working. Okay. All right, so I have no conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose, but if anybody has any hookups, some money, I'm happy to advertise whatever you'd like. Okay, so I'm gonna, I know what button I'm gonna have to use. Okay, who likes really busy PowerPoint slides when you're watching a presentation? Everybody wants to just read to themselves, right? And what we say doesn't really matter. So I have a lot of information to cover and all my slides are gonna look like that. Is that, is that good for everybody? I love it when I don't have to tell my audience when to laugh. So I appreciate your polite laughing. Okay, so just kidding. So on Saturday, there's a woman who is doing a presentation on how to build PowerPoint slides. And I don't know if she's here yet. Her name is Sharon, but uh, I'm hoping that I pass her tests for my presentation today. My presentation is gonna be mostly visual. So for those of you, I know that there are, I really am gonna step off of this before this, is, any orthopedic people here? Okay, take care of my knee. All right, so I, I know that uh, these, the, this presentation is available on a computer. This is all visual. I really don't have a whole lot of verbal stuff. So if you wanna take notes, you're welcome to do so. But this is just gonna kind of be a conversation, a one-way conversation where I'm just talking to you. Okay, so a little bit about me. As it was mentioned, um, I started my career in the fire department. Um, I, I, actually, I was in a calendar a long time ago, thank God, before the internet was created, and, uh, and that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I literally did rescue a cat from a tree. We pulled a ladder truck up, a lady, we, the, nobody's ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree, right? The patient, or the lady who called 911, her cat was stuck up in the tree, and she was going to stroke out, and we ended up going and getting the cat for her. Um, these two guys, if you've had an EMS background or you're old enough, you'll recognize Johnny and Roy. Um, I really loved the fire service, but when I became a paramedic, I fell in love with medicine. I fell in love with making that connection with patients, even for a short period of time. And so, uh, so I stuck with medicine, obviously, going on to my next careers. So... 11 years into the fire service career, I picked up a 275 woman off the floor by myself, blew a couple of discs in my back and I was medically retired. And so I thought to myself, hmm, what career could I choose where my back would be protected from further injury? So I became a nurse. While in nursing school, a little funny anecdote, I actually wore a naughty nurse costume for a Halloween party. And the, uh, let's just say one of the professors who saw pictures from the party was not very impressed with my unprofessional choice. Okay, so I started off in the emergency department, straight out of nursing school, because it was the closest thing I'd done to being a paramedic. It was relatively easy. Um, I switched and started flying on helicopters after a three years of experience. Um, if anybody's based, is, is everyone here from New Mexico? Anybody not from New Mexico? Okay. Um, this is a company called Transera Medivac. They have bases in Artesia and Carlsbad and Roswell. And so I actually flew out here uh, as a flight nurse and paramedic and then subsequently later, which 
I'm gonna talk about as a nurse practitioner and flying as a nurse practitioner is the best flight job there is. So what's interesting is being in an aircraft is it's a tight cramped environment. I know it's tough to judge relative height and size. I'm 6'3", or I was, and 230 pounds, and that's kind of a big flight nurse. They uh, had to partner me with smaller paramedics because uh, I'm a little big. After my flight career, I lost down to six foot two because that cramped environment with a helmet on my head kind of squished me a little bit. And I ended up with some artificial discs in my neck too, blah, blah, blah. But when I hung up my flight suit, I went to the ICU and I got to take care of the really sick patients that I ended up enjoying. For anybody who's done critical care, um, this is a bank of of uh, pumps, a ventilator, and on the opposite side of the patient was a CRRT machine. I got to take care of the sickest of the sick. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm gonna go to nurse practitioner school, which was my plan, I wanted to keep taking care of those really sick patients. I also got tired of asking for permission to give patients you know, simple orders and medications. My, my patient has a fever. You'd think you could just give the patient a Tylenol. But no, you have to ask for your Tylenol. And I got tired of asking. So uh, another motivator to become a nurse practitioner. So I went to NP school. Uh, I graduated. Oh, where is the picture? <gasps> the best picture. I have a graduation picture of me and uh, I'm about 20 pounds heavier. So for those of you who've been through NP school and you, your whole life is devoted to school and then probably work in a full-time job, you know what it's like to, to put on a little bit of weight. So I decided on the acute care track because I wanted to do critical care medicine because I loved procedures. I loved doing lines. Um, when I was a flight nurse, we were trained to do uh, point of care sonography when it was sort of new to the bedside uh, trauma assessments and such. I loved that. Going back to being a paramedic, I managed airways. I love managing airways. It's almost too easy now with the glide scope and the CMAC and the video laryngoscopy. Um, you guys really all need, if you're going to do airways, you need to go back to doing DL just to make it interesting. I like making new holes in patients, love doing chest tubes. Uh, that rush of air with the finger thoracostomy is super exciting. But most importantly, I, I like taking care of the sickest of the sick patients. I take my hat off to everybody here that does primary care or clinic medicine. Um, I just don't have the patience to deal with non-compliance and patients who won't do what you tell them. Uh, now you send them to me after you know several months or years when their chronic issue becomes an acute issue, that's my bag. Okay, so enough about me. Well, see, that's how things got screwed up there. There's the picture, look how much heavier I am there. So um, I graduated, uh, passed my boards on my first try, somehow got really lucky. It was actually on my birthday, so it was a fantastic birthday gift to myself. Got my license, did my NPI, and got my DEA. And then the brakes locked. Who's been through hospital credentialing? Okay. There are slow things in the world. Medical staffing offices are clearly the slowest thing in existence. COVID, it was amazing, the fire that was lit under their rear ends with COVID. I can't, I don't understand why that isn't always the case. So when I was in my last clinical rotation, um, I was waiting out the rigorous and incredibly redundant part of credentialing. Went back to flying on helicopters again, as I mentioned, which was the best job. I was lucky I got hired into uh, my critical care residency straight after my second um, uh, clinical rotation. So uh, it was just a fantastic group of amount of timing. Um, I also flew and worked full-time on nights. So I had two full-time jobs as a, as a critical care resident, which was pretty intense for real. So got my experience and got divorced and sold my house and kept my dog and got the Jeep. And I moved to Colorado um, because that's really where I wanted to be. It's kind of like a sad country song. Uh, I don't know where this picture actually is from in the Rockies. It's definitely from the Rockies somewhere. That's what the internet said. And I'd really like to find it but it's beautiful. But the thing is, if anybody has lived in the Denver metro area or in the front range of Colorado, there's lots of hospitals, there's lots of ICUs, 
there's not a lot of jobs. <laughs> Pretty competitive environment. Um, a lot of people want to live there. And if you can get a job, it pays abysmally horribly. So I decided, eh, let's try this road thing. So I became a traveling provider. My first job out of the gate was uh, a contract position as a PRN. I was actually a, a, a PRN employee, but I sort of negotiated it as a locums-like contract. I built uh, my travel and expenses into my hourly rate, which they were nice enough to, to choose to pay me. Um, I had complete control over my schedule, which is one of the big advantages of being a locums provider. But one thing I didn't keep in mind when I was adding up all my, this is actually the first, I think those are the right dates, yeah. This is the first spreadsheet that I built with all my expenses on it. I didn't keep in mind that when you're paid as a W-2 provider, you are taxed on all of the money, not just on the part that you're not spending on expenses. And so I kind of hosed myself a little bit uh, when it came tax time. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so my first contract in Corpus uh, that I was recruited for, I'd never been to the Texas coast and I learned so many things. Uh, I learned what Gulf Coast humidity is all about. And I learned a brand new medical term that I didn't, didn't know, it's called hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating. It was just absolutely miserable. I don't know how people live in environments and climates that are humid. More importantly, as a provider though, I hated, or I learned to hate Meditech as a provider. I had learned to use Meditech as a bedside nurse, at least the ER version of it, the provider side. Who's used Meditech as a provider? Oh, atrocious, horrible. Epic is the way to go. Cerner's a distant second. So all this joking aside. So I, what I learned from this first experience in Corpus, although it wasn't a locums contract, it was a locums like contract, I learned uh, why we call it medical practice because if people practice enough at something, you figure they'd get better at it. Well, it turns out that just means people do things differently, you know, from their training in the 1990s. That's what I learned. So because of that, flexibility is really important. If you're a rigid black and white person, you're not able to adapt to new situations and be flexible, you're probably not gonna have a lot of success as a locum provider because you are gonna be dropped into situations that are just very surprising. I learned to bite my tongue. Um, turns getting along with people is important and um, being right, even when you know you're right with evidence-based medicine and practice, that kind of uh, might rub some people the wrong way. So without ruffling feather, feathers, you just want to be able to get along. I learned in my first week that narcissists and unhappy people are frequently locums providers. Um, this is not the case with me, but with some other people. And the reason those narcissists and unhappy people are locums providers is because they can't keep a job in the real world. I also learned that weak and insecure providers are frequently locums providers for the same reason, because they can't keep a job. I learned to temper my big personality. You guys don't know me, but I kind of have a large personality. And so I had to kind of settle that down and listen. This is a new concept for me. Listen as much as I talk. Who knew that was possible? My girlfriend's sitting right here. She'll tell you that uh, I try to listen. Okay. In summary, is it working? Yes. Okay. I didn't change who I was or as a person or a provider, although I had to modify some of the things I did and you kind of have to go under the radar maybe if you want to do evidence-based practice. But I learned to be one of these cute little things. I learned to be a chameleon and that's really the key to being a, an effective locum provider is to go into a situation and match yourself with the group, the practice, the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. You have to fit in with a bunch of new docs. 
a bunch of residents, a bunch of new specialists, a bunch of bedside nurses that you don't know. I luckily in Corpus got to work with a bunch of fantastic APPs. We had some really strong nurse practitioners and PAs who had been on the road and had been traveling. And so that was a really great experience, but fitting in like a chameleon is the key. Okay. So why would anybody want to go on the road? Why would anybody want to be a road warrior? On the left is a young Mel Gibson before he went crazy. Um, if you're born before 1975 and you remember the road warrior movies from the late 70s and early 80s. On the right is Tom Hardy for all you millennials who uh, remember only the movie from 2015. I really wanted to pick up, put up a picture of Charlize Theron because she's the best part of the newest movie, but it didn't really seem appropriate, so I digress. So why would people want to be a road warrior? I mean, you have to leave home, leave your family, leave your kids. I don't have kids, but for those of you who do, you, you're added, you got all this travel stress. You potentially are opening and starting new contracts every few months. I mean, I've worked contracts that lasted just a month. I've worked contracts that have extended for 18 or 20 months. But going through the whole process of credentialing and doing all the things and getting new licenses several times a year can be a really big pain in the butt. And then your comfort zone, you know, you get into practice and you're comfortable, you know, all the people, you know, all the things. So what are the reasons why people would choose to leave that? Well, because sometimes life at home gets boring. That's why I moved or the money we talked about. There's also something to be said for trying out something new. Sometimes life at home is not ideal. Sometimes you want to escape this, these things. What, what are those called? Kids, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, so I don't know what that's all about. But in reality, it all comes down to money. Locums providers make significantly more money than staff APPs or doctors for that matter. Uh, in my respective critical care assignments, I've made 30 to $100 more per hour than the staff nurse practitioner doing the exact same job sitting next to me. And that's honestly one of the biggest motivators. I'm about to begin a contract in May, and I'm going to be making three times what I made as a new grad. So that'll kind of give you an idea of where those numbers are. The other important thing that I mentioned is my calendar. And this is actually my calendar for this September. And I hope you guys can read that. I'm working till the end of August, and then I'm going to the South Pacific on a dive trip for two plus weeks. And then I'm coming home and I'm getting my sleep schedule switched back. And then I'm going to the Jeep Jamboree in Oray up in Colorado before I go back uh, to work. So there's not very many staff jobs out there where you can take three and a half weeks off. So that's a big plus. Anybody here relocated for a job? Okay, that's the, <laughs> it's, a big, it's a big move to relocate for a job. One of the advantages to being a locums provider is that a lot of locums positions are hospitals that are searching for a permanent provider to come in. And so it's a great test drive. If you can get in as a locums provider first, you can get a feel for the group because you know when you go, for those of you that have relocated, when you go across the country and you fly in and they wine and dine you and they show you the unit and point out all the things, that doesn't really give you a good idea. Even in an interview, you don't really get a great idea of what the practice is gonna be like with the group. So um, consider a locum's position to be a, a, you know, a multi-month interview process. Um, but the true challenge, and this is one of the things that I really benefited from, is that you get better at your job when you are forced to work in environments that you're not comfortable. And it has made me a much better provider um, having traveled and having done all these, these positions and contracts. Does everybody remember the movie Taken? Yeah, okay. It's embarrassing when you have to explain your memes to your audience. Um, some other advantage that comes with locums travel is perks. Uh, I am now 1K with United. So essentially every flight that I take, well, probably nine out of 10 flights, I get upgraded to first class. It's kind of nice when I go on vacation and I immediately get some benefits and perks. Also, all the hotel chains 
provide you with points. I haven't paid for a hotel room for my own personal, well, obviously I don't pay for it when I'm working, but for my own personal travel, I haven't paid for a hotel room in a couple of years or more. So, and I don't plan to. So that's kind of nice. Okay. So I've told you all the wonderful things about being a travel provider. There's a lot of negatives too, let's be honest. Locum's work is not all rainbows and fairy tales. Um, and there's a really good reason why locums providers make more money. It's because we have to put up with a lot of stuff. While traveling can be fun, there are realities. Missed and canceled flights, lost baggage, thankfully. Knock on wood, I have not had a bag lost yet. Uh, rental car snafus, if anybody's tried to rent a car since COVID, since all the rental car companies sold all their cars off, um, they are now building them back up, but it's been a real headache to get rental cars in some of these locations. Crappy hotels, loud neighbors. Um, you know, not everybody has to get up at 5 a.m. for a seven o'clock shift and work 12 hours. If you're working nights, which I really try not to do, not a lot of people sleep during the day, it turns out, in a hotel. Who knew? Um, one of a recent contract that I worked with was in southwestern South Carolina. Um, just west of Clemson. And so I would stay in Clemson. And if anybody knows the Clemson Tigers of the SEC, they're a pretty good football team, I've heard. Not this year, but in the years past. And so every Friday and Saturday night, all the hotels would fill up with Clemson fans who all like to drink and be rowdy. And so sleeping on those weekends was a little tough. All right, this is not my suitcase. I don't think I have such colorful attire, but living out of a suitcase kind of sucks. Um, I have gotten in the habit now of really trying to unpack my suitcase and live out of the, the bureau or the chest of drawers that the hotel provides because finding things in a suitcase really stinks. Eating while you're on the road just sucks especially when you're working 12 hour shifts and you're working in a rural area and there just are not a lot of restaurants, restaurants that are always closed on Sundays. I mean, I kind of like Chick-fil-A in the mornings, but they just need to be open on Sunday mornings. Just feed me. Um, but a lot of these small towns, they don't have a lot of places to eat. So we'll talk about uh, being successful and, and planning dietary stuff in a little bit, but this is a real negative. It is tough to eat healthy when you're traveling and living in a hotel. Uh, my biggest disgust of being on the road is when you spend $5,000 on a mattress, you really want to sleep on your mattress, not in a hotel's crappy mattress. So um, that is a negative. Additional downside. So when you're a new provider working as a staff APP, you know, you get a nice orientation and frequently you get a mentor that you get to shadow and follow around and you get some guidance and stuff like that. And that can last, you know, for a few days or a week if, if people are really generous. Locum providers, you know, not really so much. We uh, are expected to hit the ground running. A four hour orientation is a long orientation. <laughs> um, you get a little bit of EMR exposure. Hopefully you've used the EMR. That is one thing to look for is to, you know, locum's contract is to find EMRs that you know. Um, you know, you, you might have someone show you the unit, say this is the desk and computer where you're gonna chart and that's the bathroom and best of luck. And that's really all you get. So you have to be in a position in your own practice to be comfortable to work independently without a whole lot of guidance. So, oh, and these are, of course, the three big ones. Um, I have done contracts now with all three of these, and it has made things much easier. I have not actually used the old version of Meditech. I don't know if it's still around, the non-Windows version. Is anybody still using that? I hope not. Good. Okay, so why is there a market for locums work? Lots of different factors. Hospital need contracted labor, and... I'm sort of generalizing my presentation to hospital work. That's where most of the locums contracts are, but there are some, for those of you that do do primary care, there are primary care and specialty stuff too. Um, obviously we all have experienced COVID in the last couple of years and the 
requirement or demand for locums work and travel work in the last couple of years has just been crazy. Gotten to the point where locums companies, if you have a pulse and you're warm and you have a license, you can have a job. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really been that bad. Um, the first, uh, first year of COVID, I actually was keeping track of all the patients that I was involved with that died and it got too depressing. Uh, not because of my care, by the way, it's because it was this virus. Uh, that was funny, it's supposed to be. Um, <laughs> and so I stopped keeping track of that because I was getting too depressed. But in January of this year, I actually intubated my 100th COVID patient and that was kind of a milestone. Um, and I kept track of that, obviously do, you know, we have to keep procedure logs. So uh, it was, a, it was a, a big thing for me. Hospitals uh, frequently need providers because they're in places that are kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they're places where, you know, well-educated professionals don't necessarily want to live. Um, I don't begrudge anyone for living and working in rural America because there are a lot of people that need, need medical care. And my hat's off to you. Um, it's not a good fit for, for my lifestyle, but uh, if you are willing to go to places where people don't want to work, there are just jobs after jobs after jobs. Uh, frequently, facilities and practice groups will fill in for vacancies. Um, I just was offered a contract uh, for the fall for an anticipated uh, maternity leave. Uh, I've worked and seen contracts where people are off on FMLA or have some kind of uh, surgery or medical issue of their own. So lots of reasons. Anyone who spent time at the bedside knows of a doctor or a group of physicians who are just angry. They're just unhappy people uh, under a lot of pressure and they create this toxic work environment. And it's amazing when you are in a toxic work environment, how you just don't wanna be there as a nurse practitioner or a PA. Um, and frequently in these groups, the, the providers will just put the scut work on the APPs. You know, oh, you just do the charting, you just write the notes, you know, where you're not actually gonna practice any medicine. Uh, and it's, just, it's no wonder that they can't keep providers there in those positions. So frequently those are the APP positions that are then turned over to locums companies. Um, as a locums provider, I've worked in places where I am just an overpaid scribe. And I'm okay with that. Uh, hospitals uh, up in Denver, where I'm, where I, right near where I live, Lutheran Hospital is building, SCL Health is building a new, big, huge, beautiful facility. So frequently hospitals, if they're broadening a service line, will bring in locums providers to cover until they can hire enough folks. Um, I worked a contract that I will not tell you where, where all the doctors and APPs were terminated. So seven docs and three APPs were all cut loose. Um, they weren't, the hospital system was not happy with their, the care was not happy with how they were running the schedule, how were they were managing the patients, how everyone was intubated for uh, 12 days before they were extubated, et cetera. So it turns out hospital, Politics can be a minefield. I try to stay out of those things, especially as a locums provider. You don't want to get involved with any of the BS that's going on at the hospital. Um, real quick, for those of you, has anybody traveled as a locums provider here? If you have, just one. Okay, good. Am I telling the truth about all this stuff? Okay. So locums, use of locums providers is sort of a regional thing, which is interesting. So there's a lot of locums use on the East Coast and the Southeast, the Southern part of the country, a little bit through the Midwest um, and kind of to the Rockies. And then once you kind of get West of the Rockies, there's just not a lot of locums work, at least not in critical care. Um, California specifically has Outpatient, like the, for, for those of you in primary care, there's tons of primary care stuff, but there's not a lot of hospital stuff. And I don't know what the reason for that is. I've never really dug into trying to research it, but I kind of think that the managed care systems, Sutter Health and Kaiser and stuff, they, they don't like to spend the money that it costs to hire locums folks. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, COVID exploded the use of locums providers. I mean, just literally 
it was insanity. There were weeks and months during the Delta wave increase and at the beginning of Omicron through this winter, I would literally get five to 10 recruitment offers every day. And the money was just stupid. Um, 140, 150, 160. I was offered a, or recruited for a contract in New York for over $200 an hour, which is just kind of unheard of. Um, I don't know where kind of things are going to fall out now that, thank goodness, we're kind of have COVID behind us. Um, I think the pay for locums providers is going to stay a little higher than it was. But you know, my first contract, actually, ironically, here in Albuquerque, um, was you know typically they were paying seventy five to one hundred dollars an hour. I negotiated one hundred five an hour to work here um, right before COVID hit. So I think the money is going to be there um, going forward because I think everybody's just used to getting paid more and people are holding out for more. Did anybody here is, who's a nurse practitioner leave? advanced practice and go back to the bedside to work as an RN during COVID? Anyone? For a lot more money, right? <laughs> so uh, it, what's crazy, I worked, you know, as a locums provider, there were places where I worked where the bedside nurses were making more money than me as a locums provider. So um, I have friends that went back to the bedside and were making 150, 160, $170 an hour, just insanity. Oh, one last thing I want to mention. Um, once you develop a positive reputation, if you get a couple contracts under your belt, if you're reliable, and if you get good feedback from the facilities where you work, your recruiters are going to keep coming back to you because they want to put successful people in into these positions because the locums companies only get paid when you get paid. Okay, so to start this process. Organization ahead of time. Getting organized is so much easier, but it is a lot. Um, having an updated CV is the first start, but make sure your CV is a document that you can edit. I made the mistake of getting a pretty CV made by a graphics designer that I couldn't edit, and I had to just throw it away because it was outdated in six weeks, and I didn't want to keep spending money just to have her add one or two things. Um, on my CV, this is my ugly CV. Um, that's just in a Word document, I put my picture. I've heard people say, don't put pictures on. You know, we live in a society with cultural bias, unfortunately. But I think having your picture on your CV makes you stand out a little bit instead of just, you know, words on a paper. One other important thing that I decided to do, and I don't remember who recommended this to me, but I created a bio for myself. Um, I use it when I do conference presentations. I use it for any jobs that I consider applying to. And basically, it's just a couple paragraphs that summarize your CV. Um, and I think that would will make you stand out for sure. And this obviously applies to, to regular jobs as well as uh, locums jobs. Also, shows a recruiter or an employer that you can write in complete sentences. All right. So who remembers the joys of their first credentialing? Oh, my God. Just most miserable experience in the world. Um, if anybody knows the name Christopher Dun Dunch, Dench, the doctor who was at Baylor, the neurosurgeon who killed a bunch of people and maimed a bunch of people, that's kind of why our credentialing stuff is the way it is, is because uh, they didn't really do great credentialing processes 20 years ago. So the credentialing that you have to go through, whether you're starting a new job or as a locums provider, will include your applications, your CV, if your state or the facility uses CAQI, transcripts, licenses, work history, addresses and phone numbers, insurance binders, references, verification of privileges, proofs of vaccination, and on and on and on. It is great if you have this all organized on your computer in a nice handy folder that you can then just send it out to whoever you need it to send it to. Now, thankfully, depending on the state, because some states have a few different requirements, and the provider group and or hospital group, the locums companies will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. If you have this stuff organized, you just send them a file with all your stuff and they make it all happen. It's like magic. Um, I'm finishing a credentialing process for a state uh, to the east of us here at one facility and it's been an absolute nightmare. The locums company can't make it better. So um, keep in mind, you just have to be patient. But being organized will be a really big help. 
So now that we're organized, let's find a company. And there are lots of locums companies. There are five or six of them here on my slides. Um, I have interacted with probably a dozen and there's a bunch every day I'll get a new solicitation or a phone call or a referral to some company I've never even heard of. I responded to a, a, a thing yesterday to a company based in Dallas that I'd never heard of. It can be overwhelming when you're getting emails and phone calls and texts. Um, again, it all comes down to organization. What I would suggest to each of you is if you're gonna engage in this process, build a spreadsheet and keep track of the companies, keep track of the uh, recruiters with their contact information and put the details that you know of the contract you're discussing. And I mean, my spreadsheet now is pages and pages long of all the people that I've talked to. Um, one other thing that's important, you're gonna be, get communication from recruiters. You know, let's say you get an email from a recruiter and you reach back out to them with your phone number, then you're gonna start getting text messages. Make sure when you get a recruiter's information that you put their contact info into your phone. I can't tell you how many times, again, these are the mistakes I've learned from where I'll have a text thread where I've been contacted by a recruiter, let's say 10 times, and I don't have that recruiter's name in. So I've got to scroll back through and figure out who they were and what company they come from. Just put that information in your phone right from the get-go. So now that we're organized and ready, how do we find a contract? How do you choose? So you can go to the National Locums Clearinghouse. It's a new website that just came out and it's got all the locums positions around the country all in one place. That's a joke. There is no such website. It would be great if there was. The problem is, is that these locums companies, if they have exclusive contracts with specific hospitals or hospital systems, they wanna keep it protected. They want you to go to them. So there is no national clearinghouse. If anybody has searched for locums positions online, you will get a whole bunch of websites that all lead to some locums company website that doesn't really give you much information. You kind of have to be on their mailing list to get their stuff. Finding a recruiter is probably the most important thing. The locums companies, in my experience, essentially all do the same thing. Um, some of them do a little bit better than others, but I can't say that any one company is any better than another. And I've worked with five now. Um, the key is your recruiter. Your, the relationship you develop with your recruiter is really important. Um, having a recruiter that reaches out to you, even maybe when they don't have positions available, that's a plus. Like you want someone that you wanna hang out with even. I have a recruiter that I started working with actually on my UNM contract uh, several years ago that I'm still like buddies with, like we text message and send each other inappropriate memes and talk about golfing and drinking scotch. So uh, that's the kind of recruiter that you, you, know, you kind of want to have that kind of relationship. But even with a recruiter, even with a company, you're going to have to still wade through emails and text messages and stay organized. When you get a solicitation, let's say through an email, sorry. This is how it looks. So you'll get an email from blah, 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 locums company. They'll give you sort of a region or an area. They'll tell you some dates, the shifts, what kind of a position it is, uh, et cetera. Um, but they never really give you all the details. They won't tell you what hospital system it's with. You, they want you to call because they wanna make contact with you because that's, you know, you become their customer and that's how they make money. Um, but if I've never worked with a company, like I get emails all the time now from people that I've talked to, but if it's a new company or a new recruiter that I'm not familiar with, I make the effort to actually have a phone call because that's going to make a good impression. It's going to put you in a good light in, in the face of that, in the face of that recruiter. Oh, there's the phone. That, that was the slide for the call. Okay, so once you're approved or the recruiter has looked at your CV and told you that you, I love this meme, if you guys want to just laugh at that for just a second, um, they decide you're approved and they will ask you for your CV. Um, and once they do that, they're going to want to move forward and they're going to want to present you. Okay, I'd like to present you is the 
phrase that they'll use. And that, what that means is they're sending your CV and your new bio that you just created to the hospital and the hospital is gonna review it and make sure that you're appropriate and a good fit. The key is though, when a, once a locums company presents you to a facility, they own you. Even though you haven't signed a contract and you haven't worked a day, your presentation is owned. So there are circumstances, like some hospitals have exclusive contracts with certain locums companies. Others kind of just open it up to all the locums companies. But once you're presented by one company, you're locked in. I had a situation, I was presented at Loveless. I actually just did a favor for my recruiter because he needed to have a number or something. I, it was a position I didn't want and he presented me at Loveless. And then nine months later, I actually got a position, recruited for a position at Loveless that I really wanted. And the Loveless wouldn't even talk to the next company because I had already been, I had already been presented. So before you commit or agree to be presented, make sure that it's, there are not other companies that could do, you know, do a little bit better by you. Okay, 1099 versus W-2. So everybody here has worked a W-2 job, a W-2 job where you get benefits, they take your taxes out, they pay half your payroll taxes, you get 401k, you get your money for stuff like this um, versus 1099 where you're an independent contractor. Most locums companies with a couple exceptions are all 1099 employees. So if you need benefits, you don't want to go with the companies that are not going to provide them for you or your family if you need them. Um, keep in mind that as a 1099 independent contractor, your taxes are not withheld. So don't get stuck in the trick bag. I actually work with a PA or worked with a PA who didn't realize she'd never, she's a young woman. She'd never had an independent contractor job and she didn't withhold any of her own taxes. And at the end of the year, she had to write a check for $62,000. So keep in mind that you have to set this stuff up. Um, what was made worse, is in 2019, the tax law that came out, we lost as W-2 employees, a whole bunch of deductions. Is anybody aware or did that affect anybody's pocketbook? We lost all the deductions for business deductions, for travel and for relocation and for job search. All that stuff was wiped out. Obviously that doesn't affect independent contractors. So I'm not an accountant, I'm not a tax advisor. Please talk to an accountant or a tax advisor before you start this process. Uh, this guy's available uh, if you've watched the news. Uh, one thing, uh, I have formed an LLC and I now file as an S corporation. I'm not gonna give you the details of that stuff, but there are tax advantages as a 1099 contractor. If you form a corporation on your own, it makes, and even actually for those of you who work staff jobs, forming an LLC uh, does provide some benefits. Okay, so where do you wanna work? This is really important, location, location, location. Um, we are not compensated for our travel time. Let me say that again. We are not compensated for our travel time. So if you're working, I call them hitches when I go to work somewhere for a week at a time or however long, you go to work for a seven day hitch and you have to travel, you're not paid for the day to get there and you're not paid for the day to get home. And so keeping track of your travel arrangements is very, very important. Um, we want to avoid unpaid commuting time as much as we can. So I live in Denver. It's obviously in the center of the country. I live near a major hub airport, United and Delta, and everybody flies in and out of there. I can get to most places in the country with a single flight and maybe one connection. Um, I've gotten to the point now, I've done this enough, long enough that I will not consider a contract that requires two connections. It, it, it just is it's too much unpaid time. Another thing to consider is distance from your destination airport to where you're working. So keep that in mind. Um, long layovers, want to avoid all those things. 
I'm gonna be a little redundant here. So here in Albuquerque, and I, I used to work here, so I've flown in and out of the Sunport. Um, or if those of you who live in New Mexico, maybe down near Roswell, or you know, maybe um, El Paso is your closest airport. Frequently, you're gonna have to fly from your orig origin airport to a major hub and then connect to where you're trying to go. So imagine if you're trying to get to Billings, Montana, for instance, from Albuquerque, Albuquerque to Denver, a layover, Denver to Billings, you're adding unpaid time. Um, it, just, you wanna avoid that. So whenever you're considering a contract, you get a solicitation. The first thing I do is not to call the recruiter. The first thing I do is I go to Travelocity or to United, because I'm 1K, and I build my itinerary. I see how long it's gonna take to get to my destination. I then get on Google Maps and I see how far a drive it is from the Greenville Spartanburg Airport to Western South Carolina where I'm gonna work. Gotta plan this, all this stuff ahead. Don't accept the, the locums recruiter, you know, and in their advertising, they'll be like, we're gonna take care of all your travel, except they're not gonna pay you for your time to travel. So always important to keep in mind. Um, when it is time to come to work and you, you know, let's say we've, we've moved ahead, we've accepted the contract, all that stuff, build your own itineraries and tell the locums company, this is the travel that I want. Don't let them say, well, this is the, this is the travel we chose for you. Why? Because it's the cheapest. I always fly on the more expensive flights just so I can get more travel points. Uh, but but be, it, this is about your convenience and your time because again, it's all unpaid. I have a great anecdote, but I'm running a little long, so I'm not gonna be able to tell it. This is a great meme. This is what it's like driving to the airport or driving to the from the airport to your destination hotel. Okay, so the recruiters determined your interest, you're qualified, the hospital has accepted you, decided the location, the travel meets your wishes. Most important question, what is your desired rate? You're gonna be surprised because you'll be just having this casual conversation with your recruiter and the recruiter's like, how much do you wanna make? And you're not prepared to answer that question in that moment. You're like, uh, I don't know, you know what I, you really need to, to think about this stuff ahead of time. So don't commit, but be prepared to defer the question. What you really wanna ask is, what is the facility considering offering? because they're gonna lowball you and then you're gonna meet in the middle. You have to be confident about negotiating your worth and your value. Locums companies build a significant profit into your hourly rate. So let's say as a locums provider, you're making $100 an hour for a round number. The locums company is charging the hospital $200 an hour or more. So they have room to work, find a, find a happy medium. Okay, um, as we discussed earlier, locums contracts frequently pay more than staff APP contracts. Uh, we talked about the unpaid portions of travel time. Um, it's important to determine what's your worth. So I just wanted to put this picture up. Do you remember when we were all at the nurse's station and nobody had masks on and everybody smiled? Yeah, those days probably are long in the rearview mirror and won't come back. So as I mentioned earlier, travel rates when I started were 75 to $100 an hour. They went through the roof with COVID and we'll see where everything shakes out after COVID is over. Um, I think rates are gonna come down from the peaks that we're seeing now, but, but they're gonna stay as a little, bit, a little bit higher than where we were. Okay, so before you negotiate a rate, before you're presented, before you commit to a contract, you've got to do your research. You've got to figure out all the things. You've got to make phone calls. You've got to get on the internet, do all the things before committing to a contract. All right, choosing your schedule. So keep in mind when you're coming into this process, do you want to make locums your full-time gig? You know, do you want this to be how you earn all your money? Or are you going to do locums work around your other full-time schedule that might be seven on seven off and you have a bunch of days. Or, you know, you just can pick up for, <coughs> excuse me, you can pick up for a little extra cash sometimes a couple of days a month. They, those contracts are out there. Most of the contracts I've worked are seven on seven off. Um, about a quarter of them were 
you know, they had staff APPs that had to be out or they were down a person or two. Um, and then there were some contracts where they literally would just take anything you had to offer. You, you know, I can work one day and they will literally fly you all the way to wherever to work one shift and come home. And they'll frequently pay you a bonus because they're really hurting. Okay, costs, expenses, and reimbursements. So as I mentioned, um, airfare, rental car, and hotel should always be paid by your locums company. I've actually on a couple of the Facebook pages that are specific to locums, I've seen people say, oh, they, you know, they're not paying my hotel. What? No. Make them pay your hotel. Um, there is also reimbursements available to you as a 1099 provider through locums companies for, um, for your drive time to the airport and your parking a vehicle. So make sure that you submit for that stuff. My first contract here in Albuquerque, I did not know that and I lost that on about $1,500. The uh, state, or rather, I'm sorry, the, uh, the company should pay for your licensing, your DEA if you need a new one, your prescriptive authority, and your fees for credentialing. Um, don't make, don't pay the hospital fees for your credentialing. <clears throat> your employment contract is gonna outline your commitment, your shift dates, pay rate, read those, make sure that all the information is correct. We all sign away our lives when we're buying houses and buying cars and we don't read the details. Make sure you read the details of your contract because frequently those contracts are, there are errors on them. Don't forget holiday pay, exactly. It's not time and a half now. <laughs> okay, so little things. As we talked about earlier, be, be flexible. Um, mold yourself to the practice and provi the provider style and practice of the place you're going. You're, everyone here is used to charting. I can't read what that says, I'm sorry. He's holding up a sign. Time is up. I'm only at 51 minutes online. Okay, I'll wrap this up real fast. Um, you know, we, we've all been trained to chart in certain ways. You need to chart the way they chart. So you're gonna have to be flexible with that. Get along with everybody. Find someone to answer your questions, be it a tech, a charge nurse, another provider, et cetera. Um, extroversion versus introversion. The key is just make relationships. You know, you, you're meeting new people, you're working with new people. Um, it's easier for me as an extrovert, I think in some situations, but I also don't make the close relationships. And don't complain. Don't go into a facility and say, oh, well, I just came from this academic center at the University of New Mexico, and you guys are practicing medicine from 1998. We need to update that. that that's not the time or place to do it as a locum provider. Um, we talked about food and diet. Plan for your food, exercise, sleep. Plan your sleep ahead of time. Um, we'll talk about, I, I'll just let this other stuff go. Um, Enjoy the place you're going when you're not on shift. I was really lucky. I got to uh, ski with my critical care director and her husband because they had a house in Big Sky. Form those relationships. Enjoy the places you're going. It's uh, definitely worth it. Um, if you're a good fit and they want to extend and they have more needs, they're going to tell you. You don't have to go asking, but keep this to yourself. If you're working next to someone else who maybe is not going to be asked back, uh, gives you the opportunity to renegotiate, uh, buy out. Locum hospitals, if you are going to go into a permanent position, hospitals can buy out locums providers from their uh, contract. And that's tens of thousands of dollars. But if they like you, they'll do it. And then don't wait to find your next assignment. I am constantly fielding and looking and considering contracts. I'm looking now at stuff out to the fall. So it's just a looking for the bigger, better deal all the time. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions. This is my email address. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has anything locum specific. If you would like a list of companies and recruiters that I would recommend working with, I'm happy to share that as well. Okay, thank you so much.